genre. In the world of Hollywood, movies get greenlit and redlit. They get remade and rebooted. But we are the ideal. I'm Sam Gash, and you are listening to Ideal Remake. Thank you for listening to Ideal Remake. We take movies that either have been, will be, or should be remade and talk about what the ideal version of that remake would be. For episode 150, we're here to discuss the oldest movie Ideal Remake is probably ever going to cover and ask the questions this revolutionary movie dared to ask. For example, what if someone was so hot that looking at them instantly radicalized you? <laughs> so, <laughs> returning guests, Amanda Barnes and Kevin Mosteller, is Metropolis a movie that has been, will be, or should be remade? It has not been remade as a film. There was a really bad television adaption. Oh, was it really? Once upon a time, yeah. There it, was discussion recently of a TV adaptation that just got canceled within the last couple of years, right? Yeah, was, yeah. Uh, the the showrunner for um, Mr. Robot. Oh, that I didn't know about. Yeah, yeah. Sam Asmel. So he made Mr. Robot and now wanted to make Ms. Robot? Uh, something like that, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, Interesting. What was the one that you were talking about, the bad adaptation? There was one that was, I believe, around the year 2000. Which I felt like a sci-fi channel thing. I don't know if it was a sci-fi channel thing, but mm. it felt really low budget. It felt like we were going to uh, try to bring it into the year 2000 and it didn't really work. Mm. <laughs> this one, I know, was in development. And yeah, it was Sam Esmail, I think. And they canned it. They blamed the writer's strike. They're uh, like, wow. the writer's strike and rising costs. And they, they fully canned it. Beautiful. Which, yeah, yeah. One more thing. One more thing killed. Well, interesting that they would cancel a movie that's all about workers' rights and yeah, uh, yeah. And it was a series. It was a series adaptation. That's huh. essentially where my point just went as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, fascinating. Because well, mm-hmm. like the movie initially, part of the reason why there's the cut that I have on the DVD, which is under two hours, and then the cut that I think all three of us ended up watching, which is like two and a half, mm. one eighty two. No, longer than that. Not 180. Not less than that. Yeah, not 182. It's 230. I, 230. I, I found and watched the one that was the that I kept reading was the most accurate to what it was supposed to be originally. Yeah. yeah. That's what I looked for um, and watched. Yeah. Because like, I watched the Giorgio Moroto. Yeah, movie. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because like initially like they made a bunch of cuts because they're like this movie's too communist, mm-hmm. and so they did a bunch of cuts to try to make it less communist. And then they added them back in for these versions, right? Yeah, because they found an old reel in yeah. Argentina or something. So mm-hmm. there is actually they have been discovering pieces of this movie ever since they gave it a hack job. Mm-hmm. So essentially, what happened was it came out 1927 mm-hmm. when, in uh, prosperous times. In Germany and all over America. But the message was, you know, very pro worker. Uh, I don't I don't know if it I don't know if unions were a thing yet in 1927. Uh... But it very the message was very much you pro union, Mm -hmm. right? There's the brain in the hands and the mediator needs to be the heart, Heart. which is the theme of the film. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't sit too well with, you know, people like Hearst and Rockefeller. And so a release in America got hacked probably an hour off of it, right? Probably. At yeah, they, they took a bunch off of it, and H.G. Uh, Wells hated it. Yeah, hated famously, it. famously hated it. Just so, call it a silly. What do you call it? It was like the silliest yeah. of things, or something this, like that. Yeah, the silliest thing ever put to picture. Yeah, or something. Was, yeah, he really hated it a lot. And in America, it was also written off as a, um, a direct knockoff of uh, a Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. As well, okay. because of the you know essentially yeah, like I guess. The, the reanimation. I would think of it. Bad press is bad press, I guess. Yeah, Trying I to suppose. squash that communist message. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Who picked this one? I did. You did. Okay. Yeah. I when, was like, when I do the 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 base twenty five episodes, uh-huh. I tend to pick because I'm like, I get to pick something. Okay. And I've been deciding between Metropolis and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Oh, funny. Yeah. Different. Slightly, Very. Slightly. Yeah. Well, like, Cloudy Chance of Meatballs, I would have been like, hey, a, a fun live action mm-hmm. uh, interpretation. And I still probably will do that in the future. Mm-hmm. But for Metropolis, it was like, I feel like I do want to talk about Metropolis, though. I kind of want to go back and rewatch it. And, and it feels like a good excuse to do so. So you had already seen it. I, yeah. I own the DVD. I bought and watched the DVD eight years ago or something. And I haven't watched it since. And had you seen it? Yes. Yeah. I actually, uh, it was one that I 
saw as a very young child because my dad loved silent movies. The first ever assemble, like reassembly of it was the Giorgio Moroder one in the 80s. Mm. Okay. And so that was the first way that I ever saw it was where it was like a weird music video fever dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, fair. That's funny. So I had never seen it. And when I, I was like, yeah, I'll watch it. And then I turned it on and I was like, these sons of bitches are punishing me for not going to film school. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, long, yeah. silent movie. Uh, German, long German I'm silent so movie. I'm so sorry. No, I start, but then I, I'm like glad that I did. But when I first started watching it, I, I, started, I was laughing to myself. Because I was like, which one of these dorks picked this movie? It was me. Um, also, I never went to film school. Did you not? No. No? I, I did. I, I, we had to watch the because there was a restored you, you, 2001 edition. I was edition. like, this feels yeah. like a movie that you like would be required watching in yeah. film school. Yeah. Um, but I think that like looking at it and watching it and thinking like, wow, this was almost 100 years ago? Mm-hmm. It was, was it 25 or 27? It came out in 27. They started shooting it in 25, though. It took them two and a half years to make. A hundred years ago. Yeah. And not only are, like, you know, thematically is it sound, but the, just the the effects and everything, it's crazy. It Uh, takes place in 2026. Yeah. Yes, it does. And also the parallels are scary. Yeah. (laughs) But they also talk about the way some of these things were filmed, just the nature of the black and white cameras at the time, is that, like, they were built to last. Like, it is, like, you think of some of the old, like, faded black and white movies and they're fuzzy and mm-hmm. like you think of tv from the 80s and it's fuzzy yes yeah, yeah. well even looking there's a, a scene where you know um maria is running and she's in the cave and she's just like arr, arr, and the light comes up and it captures her and then it goes fully dark and captures her again i'm like yeah how is she sharp in all of those i it's we, crazy like how do they too. how do they pull focus yeah. In that way, with the lenses that they have, that she's sharp, it goes pitch black, and then she's, it, it's practical lighting effect. Yeah. But she's sharp every time they bring her up. I was blown away by that. One of the dudes um, I was watching with, uh, who's actually been a guest on the show, Presley Peters, talked about how where they were filming it, everything was so blown out. Mm-hmm. Like, there was so much light that it was just capturing everything. So when that light went down, it it, it was much more like an iris of it because there is no autofocus or anything. It was mm-hmm. just kind of like capturing what was going on. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Fascinating. That's interesting. Um, so, and like someone had to like do the manual turning and they were just having to do that as it went. It's crazy how like how on focus it is and yeah. how sharp everything is. And there are a bunch of shots like that in the movie. And the fact that that exists. Like it's a movie right. that's a hundred years old and film doesn't last that long yeah no yeah. no uh there i feel like there's a reason it's still you know have it be fate or whatever like there's a reason these these this film is still being talked about mm-hmm. today because yeah. he made a lot of other movies mm-hmm. we don't really talk about those too much maybe m but that's about it yeah well, and not to mention too so the book which was apparently this i thought was interesting i read that because i truthfully i did not know anything about this other than it was mm-hmm. sci-fi and it was old that's, okay. that's all I knew. Fair. Legitimately, all I knew. So after I watched it, I went through and kind of did like a really, really brief historical kind of deep dive on it. And it was, the novelist was a woman, who's mm-hmm. his spouse, yeah, yep. who also wrote the screenplay. Mm-hmm. And then you think of like Mary Shelley, who obviously a woman, and I'm like, oh, so sci-fi was just fully created by women. That is correct. That's, yes. It's just fully just the genre created by women. 100%. As is, as is horror. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I thought that was really interesting. It was a bummer to read that she later just fully joined the Nazi party. Yeah. And that, the was, na- and that Nazis love this movie. I was just going to say, don't scratch the surface no, any no, further yeah. than that. Yeah, I went down a little further and I was like, that sucks. But, yeah, you know, yeah. He white fled. women, right? Because yeah. he was half Jewish. Yeah. And she stayed to make all the propaganda films. Yep. And then later in an interview, he was like, because I guess they were talking about it, how he felt about it. And he, he didn't say he regretted making it, but his answer, this was, he was like in his 80s. And he was just like, you know, how do you like look back on something that at the time you loved, but that wound up kind of being essentially like beloved by this horrible party of people? You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's well, interesting. It's the like, history. It's like the Pepe the Frog guy. Yeah. 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 Good call. In modern terms, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. I think that it was such a. I get why it it lasted because of the the time in which it was made, as well. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I think it. I think it is due for a remake. To answer your earlier question, I think it could be remade, (laughs) and I think it's and I think it could be done in a very very cool way. I think so. It also needs to be very careful because exactly that Mm -hmm. of like when you're promoting workers' rights and, like, the solidarity of the people, 
you have to make sure that it is all people instead of mm. just these people. Mm-hmm. Right. Because there were some people of color in this movie, but they were not in a position that you wanted them to be. Of course. Well, it was 1927. Right. Not defending that, but... But it was 1927. It was 1927 in Germany. So... Yeah. And, like, the big iconic thing for this movie is the robot. And so that... So I first heard of this movie in college because it was a poster that was hanging in the office of the costume lady for the theater department. Hmm. Her name was Gypsy, and that was just her name. And she just had this big Metropolis poster with the robot lady on it. And it was like, oh, okay. And so I, just, I had that. And then I was just walking around Bookman's in Tucson one time, and I found a DVD, and I was like, oh, okay. This is that movie. I'm going to watch it. Mm. And then I have owned it since, but haven't rewatched it. And it because it's one of those pieces of, A, I love science fiction, and I love like the metaphors of everything that it does, and I love writing it. And B, I like movies. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this big combination of really where a lot of that comes from. Nazis be damned. Yeah. Yes. Always not. We can't, we can't emphasize this enough. Nazis be damned. Indeed. Nazis be damned. In every way. But uh, there's one thing the three of us can agree on. (laughs) Uh, It's Nazis be damned. Yeah. The costumes in this movie were fantastic. They have like the effects, the the art direction, the set. They were so, so good. The um, transitions were really sound good. Sound design? Yeah, sound design. Score. Or, sorry. Sound design. The score. Um, sound design on a silent movie. Yeah. I meant set design. Yeah. <laughs> set design. <laughs> the Art Deco set design. I am a sucker for well, 1920s well, Art Deco. Well, then there's the moment where, like, a fetter goes down and, like, the, the machine explodes and it turns into Morgoth. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, go, go, no, it's more, not Morlock. Mm-hmm. It's Moloch. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moloch is biblical, the biblical. Yeah. Where um, they feed it the workers. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a lot of really just the the themes kind of all wrapped together. Really, really interesting the way in which they interact. You've got like religion versus science. You mm-hmm. have, you know, um, upper class versus lower, literally upper and lower. Mm-hmm. You've got a very strong, like Madonna whore at its peak. Yeah. Literally yeah. the same actor playing both <laughs> and they don't really touch on that complex i didn't see it that written about in anything but it's like no no like very much it's like it's there but she was the saint it's like yeah yeah they contain multitudes and um, i i meant it when i made that like the opening thing like normally when i do my opening thing i pull a quote but like mm-hmm. literally it's just this woman is so hot that just to look at her whoa yeah. all the emotions just instantly it drives Ooh. men into a frenzy it drives men into a frenzy the dude at the beginning is like hey what about her and then like literally changes his entire worldview because he saw this woman walk in can i tell you that like from a watching this from my perspective which is a you know a female perspective the scariest part of this movie is when all of the men are ogling oh yeah um uh uh <laughs> Maria. Maria. Maria, but what the, she's she's being sorry, a, Maria the Bob. horror Babylon is what she's being. Oh uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um on the demon. And they're like all like ogling. It's like all of these like white dudes just like turn and they're like their eyes are all big and they're like ogling her. I'm like, that is the scariest thing. You could play that on loop to like a metal music yeah. and it would be the scariest shit I've ever seen in my life. It was creepy as yeah. hell. They're like ogling, they're like licking their lips. And yeah. It is. yeah, like rubbing their hands yeah, they're like, like the wolf in they're the like cartoons. They're like cartoons. Yeah. Kind of yeah. cartoon wolf. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really scary. That was, yes, I completely agree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Terrifying. It, it's a it's a very strange movie. I feel like there's going to be plenty of people listening who have not seen the movie so I do yeah. think we need to do a quick walkthrough just so people get a sense of it. Yeah, good call. But like let's just kind of start with what the world is as it's presented to us, which is the year is the far off time of 2026 mm-hmm. and society is basically just the haves, the people who are like deigned good enough to live in the city run by Fetter Senior or whatever his name is, Fetterson, which is confusing. Because it's Fetterson and Fetter who is his son. Yes. It yes. should be Fetter and his son Fetterson. I found that interesting. But as it's well, not. Because that's no. that's like the traditional German way of doing things. Too. Yeah. It's, obnoxious. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, and so like, oh, he runs the city. And so we see all these workers trudging in. Like literally, I think the opening shot is wor- is a shift change of workers trudging in uh-huh, and, and workers trudging out. out yeah. Just like completely broken, spirits gone, just showing up, doing the work of like, machinery running the machinery that we can't possibly understand yes. but being done by people and then we cut to like the pleasure garden where fetter's son fetter fetterson's son, <laughs> son fetter, fetter where the son is basically like 
the some butler guys like selecting women to entertain him for the day. They are begging to be selected. They absolutely they, they are. really want to be his companion. Chasing yes. them around the garden and everything. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Doing the whole hokey pokey. I was going to uh, there's some reference to it, but literally the whatever reference it is is referencing this, but yeah. and then up walks Maria surrounded by all of these like children. poor children and she just stands there and looks at them and then is escorted out. She's like, these are your brothers. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, the son is like, I've never seen a poor person before. And like his worldview shatters in that moment. He just like chases her down into like the undercity and actually sees workers for the first time and has this realization of, well, that's not cool. Mm -hmm. Boy, my dad's really taking advantage of people. (laughs) Well, no, no, no. I don't think he realizes his dad's taking advantage of people. He's like, dad, it's really bad down there. That's true. Because that's his next stop. That's his next move. Yeah. So then what happens? Going up to the top of the tower and saying, hey, dad, <laughs> this is really bad down there. People are really getting hurt. Oh, no, wait. We uh, we skipped a, a big portion oh, where yeah. he goes down and he witnesses an industrial accident. That's mm-hmm. right. He witnesses an explosion where he hallucinates Moloch. Well, he sees people die and then more people like just come in and take the place of the people who died. Right. Right. I feel it. But his big come to Jesus moment is he hallucinates this machine as Moloch, which is essentially the mar- the workers are just essentially walking into its mouth. Into the mouth of a them demon. Yep. As a, as a person. It, or as people, rather. Yeah. First a group of children walk in, then adults, and then it's over, and they're just back to working the machinery. Yeah. Carrying off the dead as if it was just another day at work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure it is. Yeah. Uh, so he goes and talks to his dad, and what happens? Goes and talks to his dad, and his dad is like, ah, oh, all right. And he has his, his butler dude. He, like, keep an eye on my son. It's not a butler. Sort What's of. his name? It was, like, an assistant. Uh, He's an assistant. The, the, Je- Jeho- Je- 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 Jo- Jo-Sophat. Josephat. Josephat. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this is where I think versions differ of what, what version of the film you watch, too. Okay. Because it, they also have one of the workers... The Grot. foreman, Grot. Come Grot, up the and... engineer and defender of like the kind of central core. Oh, yeah, and he's machinery. like, why am I hearing this from my son and not from you? Yeah. He echoes yeah. that a couple of times, right? Yeah. So Grot says, we fa- we've t- fired some workers, found some workers, whatever, and we found these like union pamphlets and organization meeting invitations in their pocket. And Grot tells the dad that, and the dad turns to Josephat, the assistant, and goes, why am I hearing this from Grot and not from you? Mm. You're fired. Mm-hmm. And Josephat freaks out and he's like getting fired by the dad basically Good. means i have nowhere else to go except down into the trenches mm-hmm. for the audiences this this man is like rockefeller right yes. he is he is the the guy at the top yeah like, keeping in mind too also for the audience that there is a silent film so this is all insinuated and or kind of listed and there's some dialogue cards in there when we have lines of dialogue that are thrown in. Mm-hmm. Um, but having only seen it one time, there were times I was like, what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you really have to happening? kind of read their lips sometimes. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, and they're speaking German. That's yeah. So that. for that's me, reading also, their lips wouldn't be helpful. That's also a good, um, very good point. <laughs> uh, yeah. But like, yeah. So like Josephat gets fired and then the son feels terrible about that and, and follows Josephat out and basically stops him as he's about to put a gun to his mm. head because getting fired by, by the dad is so basically means his life is over and the son's like no no no, your life's not over you can work for me it's gonna be fine go meet back at my apartment and the son continues to like have this crisis of conscience, and he goes to like where all the posh people are hanging out and he sees one worker running a machine some machine over there and he switches places with that worker meanwhile like it will be me yeah there's like a i wrote it down he wrote he it's pretty fantastic the card just like because the worker looks like he's about to fall over yeah right and he goes Listen to me. I want to trade lives with you. That's the card that pops up. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was it. Uh, because yep. I thought it was, I thought it was funny. I was like, yeah, get right to it. Sure, get right to it, dude. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, the dad has his son fall because like, no, well, I don't like what my son's doing. You, Pinkerton, basically, go, fo- <clears throat> go follow my son. That's right. And so then the son switches places with this with this guy, and then the Pinkerton, the thin man, is what he's called, mm-hmm. kind of grabs this dude who was wearing the son's clothes. And, like, kind of escorts him back home. Meanwhile, the son gets dragged, like, because he looks like a worker and is also kind of falling asleep at the clock wheel. Yeah. Whatever whatever he's doing. He ends up getting, like, drawn into, like, what is essentially a union meeting and a workers' rights meeting with all these other lower class workers, which is where he sees Maria again. Yes, where she is leading the meeting. She is kind of the sainted figure talking in front of all these men in in a very angelic 
way, so, right? She looks like a doll. Like, she's very she's very passionate, but there's nothing like sexualized about her at all. She's just this kind of glowing orb of, you know, of rallying basically. And they um, go so far as to put three crosses behind her to give that messiah complex. Very much. Yeah. And she's like Oh, like she, you know, it'd be easy. To, she's like, I'm the leader. But no, she's like, when will my, essentially, like, when will my, um, what are they keep calling him? When will this mediator? Be, mediator. When will my mediator appear? To, and, to make a communication between the hands and the head. Yes. The and, head who plans, the hands who work. Yes. And lo and behold, that mediator is there at that meeting. He sure is. Yeah. He volunteers himself. That mediator is, um, I'm going to keep on calling him Fender. Fredder. You can just call him the son. Fredder. The son. Son. Son the Fredder. Son. Yeah. And she's like, oh, yay. Finally. At long last. At long last. And, is this? And the... now we're like not even at the midpoint. No. No. Because there's long... a whole thing about the Tower of Babel, too. Mm-hmm. That they, the, yeah, she does this whole of... thing about the Tower of Babel, which also, yeah, metaphor, metaphor, a bunch of people worked to make this thing and then got abandoned by the people who designed the thing, the rich people. And, and then the, the the workers rose up and destroyed the Tower of Babel, this thing that could have been amazing, that could have led them to speak to God, but because the workers weren't respected, they destroyed this thing. Metaphors. Yeah, me- metaphor for the rest of the movie. So. But meanwhile, the dad's on his own journey. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. he's going to talk to Rotwang. Rotwang. Yeah. Rotwang. Which is the best name for a character. Oh, 100%. <laughs> we, Rotwang, we will remember his name. Absolutely. Yeah. I almost kind of want to like start a band and call it Rod Wayne. Rod Wayne would be a great band. It's, it's kind of it a cool really band would. name. <laughs> that is a that is a thresher metal band. Yeah. <laughs> Once I get good at bass, you call me. Oh yeah. Rod Wayne it up. Oh yeah. <laughs> so Rod Wayne is like a crazy scientist living in a abandoned building with no windows, mm-hmm. and it looks. He's the inventor, right? Yeah. 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 He's the inventor, and it looks like uh, almost like a Hansel and Gretel type. Old a little German bit. Uh, construction, <laughs> but also it turns out Rotwang was was in love with the same woman as the dad, but the then the son's mother, the son's mother, who died giving birth to the son. Hell, her name is Hell. Yeah, her name yes, is Hell. Her name is Hell. Yeah, her name sure is. Sure was. And so he designs this robot to kind of like take her place. He's like, look at this. I can turn this robot into anyone, and I will have this woman that I loved back. And the dad's like, cool, you could do that. Or make it it Maria and turn all the workers against her, and that way they won't rise up and revolt anymore. Mm -hmm. And he's like, okay. But secretly, he's going to turn the workers against everybody because he wants to tear down the The dad, the son, and the city. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I can have my cake and eat it too. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Rot Wang will rot everyone. (laughs) (laughs) You will all sing my name in praise. Rot Wang. Rot Wang. But that's basically kind of what happens is like yeah. Rotwang goes down and kidnaps Maria, puts her in what looks like the machine from the fifth element, mm-hmm. Tur- well, well, which was on purpose. I'm sure. <laughs> Turns the the robot lady that you've seen in all the posters into Maria, mm-hmm. but the the hoary version of her. Yeah. yeah. The Blade Runner version. That's... Yeah. He turns her into the Horror of Babylon version. So she goes literally from being Maria, Mary, mm-hmm. to being this a biblical, you know, representation of this biblical, I don't want to say biblical sex worker, but like, it's the character is a whore, right? Right. And labeled as such in the Bible. And sends her to, this is real like diabolical Bond shillin, Bond villain shit, where like, sends her to, instead of just like, killing her or whatever he basically is like information is the is the way here so he sends her to change her messaging because she has this following essentially and the evil version of her changes the messaging and then becomes just like crazy she like dances in a very like really sexual way yeah. for for 1920 like, for, i was kind of like holy shit yeah. i can't believe that this because she's wearing like pasties or something she's yeah. not wearing much at all and even earlier in the movie in the pleasure garden I think there's like nudity, like they're wearing like sheer the, there was outfits. Nudity. So I'm like, how is they had full on dress bottoms, bottoms, but then on the so top yeah. was wearing was wearing like gauze, yeah, yeah. like just gauze. Very... And I was, but I kind of it was a little jarring. I simply did not expect it. The uh, the very interesting thing about some Germany. of this is there is <laughs> number one is Germany, and number right. two there was far less censorship then than mm. there is now that was it that yeah. is true it is. kind of threw me to yeah. be honest with you because like now this movie's in the public domain yes yeah. yeah and it's it's more it's like there's more like nudity and violence than a lot of things that i see here that are 
like the rated you know, R. Yeah, yeah, right? I mean, honestly. Like, yeah. yeah. And so basically then robot Maria goes to the rich people and like drives them into this mad bacchanal mm-hmm. frenzy mm-hmm. and then also goes down to the poor people and and like you know how we were waiting for a mediator? Never mind. Let's just attack now. Let's destroy Ooh. all the machinery and then we'll at, let's just destroy all the machinery. It's real like I want to watch the world burn. Shit. Yeah. The, the yeah. Tea that's that he's going through. And meanwhile, yeah. real Maria like wakes up from being trapped and escapes from from Rotwang, mm-hmm. which good for her. Sure. Yeah. And meets up with the son and they go back down into the basement after the poor people are doing the horror around the destroyed uh, central core, the heart of the machinery, which floods everything. And they go and rescue all the children. Mm-hmm. Right. We uh, there is one uh, I feel like instance that we need to point out is the the foreman of the the workers the guy who kind of sold everybody out Grot is the one saying is the one going you stop listening to her you're destroying your own homes mm-hmm. like and yeah. I feel like a, that's a, that in itself is a message of like stop listening to this m- weird messiah telling you what you should doing you're making your own lives worse he does actively encourage them to burn the witch mm-hmm. yes so and then, of course, he is the one who represents the hands, despite being someone who completely answered to the dad before. Right. Mm. But whatever. We needed a name. We needed a face. And that face was Grot. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, big conflux, conflagration of uh, basically before the poor people realize that their children have been saved by Maria and the son, we're like, oh, my God, our children are dead. We're going to go kill everybody. And so the Bacchanal runs into this, like, mass of uh, workers and just, like, start fighting it out in the streets, tearing the city apart. And then both Marias show up and they grab the evil Maria, tie her to a stake, and burn her at the stake. Mm -hmm. And do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They kill her. And then when she's finally dead, she turns back into the robot. Yeah. And everybody is surprised by this. Shocked. Twist. Dum dum. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of the movie. Am I leaving anything out? That's the bones um, of the movie. Yeah, I mean, not, yeah. The uh, the only nuances in there really are just like the father-son relationship, mm-hmm. right? Um, and when it's spread, the information is spread to the son that Maria is now the one who's spreading this message. Mm-hmm. He's just like, but she's a saint. Like, he just, like, cannot get over it. He's the one that points to her and goes, that's not Maria. That's not Maria. Right. He's the one that recognizes that she that it's not her. It's very uh, interesting. It's interesting to see which things you're like, oh, I see the direct correlation between this film and all of these movies that have been made since that are yep. still being made. Pretty much um, all science fiction and uh, all dystopian science fiction. Yeah. Not even. C-3PO is designed to look like the robot yep. in this movie. Very much, yeah. Which is just super, super interesting. Historically significant. Yeah. Not mm-hmm. my favorite film. Historically no. significant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. I very much appreciate you taking the time to watch it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then no, talk I'll, about it. I'm happy to be. I'll watch whatever you want me to watch to come back here. Hmm. I'm always happy. Nice. Yeah. I feel like the imagery from the film is more entertaining and interesting than the actual film sometimes. Yeah, it's Well, the, the, again, it's the production design is beautiful. Yeah. And the, the ideas are still, still, you know unfortunately still very relevant yeah i think part of the reason that i read that h.g wells took issue with this movie is he took issue with the idea that anybody would be slandering technology yeah yeah i think that's that's sort of the gist that i got is he's like this like this great you know this like great gift and like kind of like how dare you and now, as somebody who's like you know, yeah. glued to my phone and, and so reachable and all not these even things, that, even, even on a surveillance and on a more basic level of like workers being kind of being used just to keep the the machine. machinery mm-hmm. afloat of a bunch of creatives sitting here around this table asking, being told to feed whatever creativity we have into the algorithm mm-hmm. so it can spit back content out for us to then buy. Yes, right. Yeah, it's uh, it's you know, more prescient kind of than, than ever, I yeah. think. So, yeah, definitely uh, definitely worth a watch, especially if you like movies <laughs> and or history, you know. I think uh, I'm glad I'm glad that I've seen it because it, it does kind of make you think. It sticks with you. It does, yeah. 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 yeah it stays sure. with you. It's, it is haunting mm-hmm. in, a, in a weird kind of... And it makes you think, which is something that most films 
don't do anymore. It depends on the movie. It does depend yeah. on the movie, but by and large, like popcorn films, sure. like, you're not walking away from you know Marvel twelve or whatever, scratching your head, going, "What was the?" It is absolutely a movie with <laughs> a message. message. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes Which... the message convoluted. A lot of messages in this one. Yeah, yeah. but interesting and interesting too to, to see who, after the fact, like I I would watch a documentary about this movie being made and the effects that it had. Absolutely. Yeah. I would absolutely watch that. I think that'd be very interesting because um, it's interesting It's interesting to see which groups set a claim to this. Right? In what way? Oh, like, like, like the, the, the Nazi like the party. Nazis. Like yeah, yeah. really yeah. being like, this is ours. Like, is it? Is it? That, yeah. You know, well, mm, and then you know, they... that's going to happen anytime someone wants to appeal to the workers is that they will adopt the message the messaging and the the things that are about the workers it's like ready made propaganda mm-hmm. yeah i mean that's what trump does he's like i'm one of you i'm just a guy working i'm just a working stiff like all of you yeah. and just like all the presidents you'd want to have a beer with which yeah. is it's basically that idea yeah right and uh, there are no presidents i want to drink with no no none none they're exclusively war criminals <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting as to uh, how, why and how America kind of was the one to uh, take a hatchet to this movie. Yeah, well, uh, that is because, what we do. Yeah, well, not only that, but, I mean, the the messaging, the idea that it was uh, kind of like labeled as a communist message and uh, against capitalism when it came over stateside, the idea that they were able to like kind of like hack it to bits and make it like disjointed and you can't understand what's going on is an interesting like side effect like you were saying who claims ownership of it it's funny that the nazis were like all in for this and then america was like yeah we need to like cut like half of this movie out because people might get ideas yeah it is interesting but let's start talking about our version Mm -hmm. like i think obviously the first important question is when should it be taking place i think in the future Good, good I, start. I like the, yeah, I, <laughs> I think. I would say, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I think, I I would liken it to maybe like a minority report future. Okay. So like, you know, a version of ours that is like utilizing some tech we already have, but as a jumping off point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think keeping the futurism is great and kind of heightening. I like kind a, of like a black the future. Mirror. I meant more yeah. when in the future. 25, 50, 100 years. When do you think this needs to be set? Because this movie set the movie set itself 100 years in the future and i don't think we need that much time yeah i i was gonna go 100 years in the future but i i i agree the way things how quickly things are moving with tech these days the only reason i mention that is because uh in a couple days my episode on time cop is gonna come out (laughs) and we set that 100 years in the future and i'm Mm. like at that point we should have time travel so i don't know what we're doing with this one i can do 100 years in the future again that's fine 2025, 2125 is just a few years away. That's true. It's like 75 years. Yeah, it's just true. set it 2100. Yeah. Like it can literally 2100 is a good year. Yeah, yeah it sounds like especially because like we can have that be the whole celebration of like everyone's mm-hmm. celebrating the end of the century. Yeah, and yeah, and good for them. And like, oh man, Y two K is really going to get us this time. I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 2100 the year 2100 is pretty solid yeah Yeah. so and that way we get to like also like like that's why everybody's coming together Mm -hmm. on the surface of like that's why there are all these parties and everything Mm -hmm. everyone's like yeah oh my god we're doing so great look what we've built in all this time yeah Mm -hmm. yeah that's 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 i think i can agree on that one okay yeah so then i think the idea of a capitalist running an entire city makes sense to me Especially if they're a magnet of, like, I, I want to know of what, right? There's a graphic novel series that I love called Lazarus. And in mm. that, have you read Lazarus? A lot, yeah, Once Upon a Time. Yeah, yeah I love it. Um, and, and that, the premise of that is that basically, I think there's like nine families run the entire world. Mm-hmm. So the world is segmented up by which families run it. And one family runs all um, um, pharmacies. Oh. Like all drugs, there's like a drug family. Yeah, and the sure. other one's like gas. And the other... They each kind of over. They kind of own this resource. Uh huh. So I think if we know like what kind of magnate this, you know, Federson is basically like what specifically, or if they've got like then like how they. Give I mean, it. I'm in the middle of listening to a podcast about the life of Rupert Murdoch mm. and the evil that he is. 
it's fostered on the world and he's a magnate of the news. Yeah. Right? And how much of the like world events have been guided by the fact that this man who owns the news mm-hmm. has been pushing it that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So great. I think that's super timely because then it also works with our message of communication. Yeah. Right. Of her coming down and trying to like spread the word and then, you know, uh, that kind of ties in thematically too. And I think, oh, sorry. Sorry. No, I was going to say, and also technology advancements as well, mm-hmm. because there are, as you pointed out with our magic iPhones, there are multitudes of ways to get the news message out now. Yes. Well, and just as many as misinformation, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, how do you know what you're getting is, and you know, part of the reason that so many families now have rifts, giant rifts in them is because you've got so many people who are convinced that their news is the real news. And the only right? news. And the only mm-hmm. news, right? Yeah. And it's caused this very, uh, it's having these very real world effects. So that's I think true. That it, you know, yeah. it's just sad, but I think it does lend itself to this sort of dystopian future that we're building. Yeah. And it, like our modern billionaires, when they reach a certain point and they don't like people saying bad things about them, they buy the news source. Mm-hmm. Yep. Jeff Catch Bezos. Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. Yeah. Elon, Elon Musk Post. bought Twitter. Mm-hmm. They bought the things that were saying bad things about them, and those things stopped saying bad things about them. Mm-hmm. So, like, having someone who controls the media and everything, it's kind of like we're doing a remake both of Metropolis and They Live. Mm-hmm. And Citizen Kane. And Citizen Kane. Mm-hmm. Because that is kind of like, you control the messaging, you control what people think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, we can have the son who has been just... He grew up in it like this is his, this yeah. is his succession. Yeah, I yes. was gonna say I actually have a pitch. Please. Um, so for the son, I think it, it's it was interesting to me in this movie where he's kind of prone to these bouts of uh, hallucinations, and you know I think that this actually does directly tie into um, succession, and that when I was watching this movie and thinking of like okay here are things that I want to keep here are things I want to change, I think it'd be really interesting if the son were an addict. Oh, because then you have you really do have these, which is like if he lives a privileged life, of course, it's something that a lot of, you know, people in that position can fall into because they just get what they want when they want it. Mm -hmm. And it's all readily available to them a day, night, all the time. And so if you have somebody that's battling these demons that then also gets thrown into this environment, then you kind of give a fun justification to these hallucinations, you know, that we can keep from the original yeah. Um, of like what is real, what isn't real, you know, and that in it's like not only is this his foundation of what he grew up with being rocked around him, he also now has the layer of like hallucinations and and his own mental health and reality. Does that make sense? That makes total totally. sense. Yeah. I yeah. was actually gonna head down that road as well mm. because they're you know, the son of the giant magnate, they're typically usually party monsters yeah essentially. Often, like yeah. you know the hilton paris hilton and people like that i could very easily see fredder being a nightclub boy doing mm-hmm. coke in the bathroom and you know that kind of yeah that kind of mm-hmm. party boy uh, and, and i don't think our maria or whatever we choose to name her needs to show up with a bunch of children no but she can literally show up to protest to mm-hmm. strike to do something to do some sort of protest against the extravagancies of this club because especially when you're that rich and like there, there are all these studies talking about how the levels of money break your brain. Yes. Mm-hmm. And like you like especially people who come from that level of privilege, oftentimes the only way they can wrap their brain around the fact that they have all this privilege and other people don't is to believe that they deserve it. Mm-hmm. Is just this inherent of like, well, I have it. Therefore, I, it's the the divine manifest destiny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like. The, we we were fated to be this great so of course we do and just to come in and like have someone question that all of a sudden he's like he and i don't think he should be going down because he's so enamored with her i think he should be going down with her because he's a do bro and wants to argue mm-hmm. and then oh, he's yeah. actually yeah. confronted with people working and then facing actual like a- have actual hard evidence in front of him mm-hmm. instead of him being immediately on maria's side the whole movie is I think he should be trying to poke holes in reality the whole movie mm-hmm. the same way his dad does, but his dad doesn't actually do it. He just lies. Mm-hmm. And I think the one thing that the son can do is that like he may be a piece of shit, but he won't lie. And as he keeps being confronted with more reality, more of his worldview keeps getting chipped away because he's not going to lie about it. Mm-hmm. He, but he doesn't know. He was fed all these things that he believed to be true. And now when he's... 
when he's actually doing it, his, doing his own research, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, he's actually finding out. Oh no, these people are actually living really hard lives. Of oh no, this person has is going from one job to another job, to their other job, and then going back to that first job and never sleeping. Like there's probably people in this far off future who live have a life expectancy of thirty years old because they work for twenty years and then die. Right. And that's just kind of what it's become. Right. But I think there could be something, too, there that's, like, very sinister. Because I thought one thing that they didn't hit on a whole lot in the movie that I was like, ooh, that's interesting, which is this emotional connection of hell. Yeah. Of mm-hmm. the wife that this inventor was in love with, but is the father to our protagonist. Or mother mother to our protagonist and the, you know, wife to the protagonist's father. It's like, that's like, that's a weird thing that they threw in. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? That didn't really have a ton of consequence. Like, it's very Severus Snape. It, yeah, yeah. It, it is. It is. It didn't, it's like. And spoilers. You, it's like you could have just, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you could have just made it like, oh, I have an evil robot and I love her. Instead yeah. it's like, I have a robot that I made after your wife and your son's mother. Like, And also kinda, here's this creepy statue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that we never really hit on again. And I'm like, that is an emotional moment. That's an, an emotional tie in the midst of all of this crazy fuckery, right? That to me, I'm like, I want to explore that more. And I was trying to think of a way to like anchor to, it's like, okay, so if the son, if there's like, One thing he cared about, and it was like the root of his trauma, his mom died. Maybe not in childbirth, but what if his... Ten years after. Yeah, but what if his mother was murdered as part of this empire that his father is running, right? Or we can go the other way with it. Mm -hmm. Another possibility is that the son can be mirroring the mother's journey, but of course going the other way, in that she could be someone who started as a worker and was someone who... That's what I was thinking is that she was like lower class yeah. and that his father and, you know, and then, and then she, you know, for whatever reason died. And in my mind, it was like a foul, like a foul I think play, we can but... do that, but I think what she can be like <clears throat> preaching all of these ideas of e- equality and like, and, and the, the troubles with privilege, but then the father keeps feeding her privilege and things and yes, she's, yes. she's starting to live this life that she's never known. And all of a sudden she likes living that life and kind of just abandons mm. her, her roots but then, of course, what often happens when someone who is exposed to something that they have no basis in, they take it too far. Mm-hmm. And in lieu of, like, anything else, of, I don't think she necessarily needs to be murdered outside of because she kept being given all of this privilege and wealth and, like, and recreational drugs. Is like she just kept wanting more and more and more, chasing the dragon, and then eventually it killed her. Mm. Yeah, I was kind of thinking something so almost like... um if you've ever seen Scarface, Michelle Pfeiffer's uh, arc in Scarface, yeah. mm-hmm. where at the end she clearly does not, not only not respect, but pretty much loathes mm-hmm. the person that she's with, but yeah. the lifestyle is more attractive mm-hmm. and the daily drugs and the, the restaurants. She's not willing and, to go back. Yeah, exactly. And, that, you know. The same is true of, of, the, of Uma Thurman in Pulp Fiction. Mm-hmm. Right, right. It, it's It's been done, but it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I just think, yeah, I think heightening that, well, not heightening, but highlighting that emotional connection for Fetter in, like, why, because I don't think that the, like, oh, I've seen this goddess and therefore I see the light, I don't think that that flies anymore. I don't particularly want it to fly anymore either, you know, but, like, what is the thing that sort of gets him invested? Because there has to be, underneath all of the coping mechanisms, there has to be something that he cares about deeply. And I think that gives them like a nice jumping off point and anger sure. to, yeah. to get into it. I feel like there's definitely would be a natural curiosity as to where my mom came from mm-hmm. as well. Right. Yeah. And like, I think we also can then do the same thing that his father tried to do. If he can try to ply Maria with the same gifts mm-hmm. and delicacies and whatever that his father plied his mother with. Mm-hmm. And I think she can say, this is wonderful. Let's go see where it came from. Let's go find out where they made this chocolate. Let's go find out where right. this jewelry comes from. And she can take Fetter and he, or the son, whatever we want to call him. We're going to change their names. And, <laughs> and like he gets to see, oh, this is the production house where they make the chocolate. That's a sweatshop. Oh, shot. no. Yeah. yeah. I think that's interesting. And and that's like, that's a bunch of tent poles and like 
vignettes, but like we still are missing some of our larger plot of like Bratwang, like you talked about, who may have been Bratwang. I think is interesting if he was also a revolutionary with the mother, mm-hmm. and when she got disillusioned and went away. He was kind of only there because he was like, well, I'm, I'm, here, I'm there because she's telling me to be here. Right. And she was probably the one who was like, you're so gifted. You're so smart. We need you. We need you. We need you. Yeah. And really, he was like, she needs me. She needs me. Yes. Mm-hmm. So he gets involved in the cause. And now he's like in the cause with the chip on his shoulder because she is left. And now he's like, well, what do I even have? Now I'm, I've become uh, the mastermind behind this whole thing. And I'm, I was only in it for her. And even more so, like, we can take it where he is still believes in the message, but it's become twisted over time of, like, mm-hmm. she didn't, like, she believes in equality and everyone, like, being equal. And he's like, yeah, everyone being equal. Let's destroy this city. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it could almost be, too, that uh, right, to, to keep kind him of. from becoming that, the Fetter Senior Fetterson the, is... The dad. The dad. <laughs> the dad is just kind of, like, giving him whatever he wants. Like, just go away, nerd, and build your little things and don't make any noise don't make any waves that will cause any sort of uprising or people to think otherwise or people to think that uh, you were ever on that side to begin with yeah you know Hmm. yeah yeah and and like we have those kind of like running through lines of the maria introducing the son to all these different things like oh you like this here's where it's from and like kind of showing him like the corruption corruption inherent in the system and like, oh, you like chicken? Well, here's where we get them from. Here's sure. the factory farm. And then Rotwang is kind of like being shown by the father of like, oh, it's all happening again. You wouldn't want this to happen again. Look, Maria is doing all these things. The exact same thing that happened to hell, the, wa- the woman you loved. Mm-hmm. You should probably prevent this from happening. And then Rotwang like does exactly that of like, cre- like the, the Metropolis robot. He's like gives to lead, try to lead the son back up to the father and in hopes of like, oh, my God, you are basically hell again, Mm -hmm. but uh, new and younger. And I'm an old man. I'm cool with this for some reason. (laughs) Mm. I uh, I really want to see like a revolutionary version of Maria. I want to see her like 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 a fucking like freedom fighter. Hell yes. Style. Uh, militant absolutely um, Sarah Connor. yeah that's yeah. what i want and i know that like this is probably just because she's everywhere right now i was anya taylor joy is who i was thinking probably just <laughs> because she's on all the furiosa stuff and i'm sure. like into it i think there are other choices there but i but that style of character this she's literally underground right um you know she's clearly good at what she does she's a good communicator she can rally a troop I want to see that type of character in this role. And I think Sarah Connor is a good way to do that because yeah. she can present as Sarah Connor from the first tournament Terminator. But then when we actually see her for real, she's Sarah Connor from Terminator 2. Mm-hmm. Right. Which right. is especially interesting when you think of like, okay, well then what's the heightened robot version of that? Well, where I and was... And do we want it cast as the same actress or is this like... Absolutely, yes, yes, same actress. Yeah, it should be. And... Uh, I think that would be a fun role for whoever gets it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But my my first thought was if it is AI and if the robot is controlled by AI, some sort of AI gone haywire. It's a robot. It could become power hungry by going down. The robot gains free will. Yeah, exactly. So rather than it becoming, that's it's it's, it's got the creator, right? Mm And it's like, oh, go and do this and spread this thing. And then it starts that way and it's just like, yeah, fuck you. What, like, why actually, do I need you? Yeah. I don't even think we need to do that because I think that we have the propaganda machine of the father mm-hmm. and we can have our Maria because it's always the propaganda machine of like the, the college protest or whatever. They're burning things down. They're attacking uh, college campuses and that's not what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you then have this, uh, basically she can be living the propaganda that is being told mm-hmm. of she mm-hmm. is doing the, the, what the, what the, what the moderates or the people in the middle actually think is going on and is doing it very publicly and very vocally and very loudly of, of like, she's shouting, yeah, let's destroy everything, as opposed to, we believe, peop- like, poor people are people. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Instead of, and it's just that simple change of it's the same motion, but now she's saying all the things that people were afraid of them saying. Yeah. yeah. So it's living the propaganda as opposed to, I don't know, being a chaos gremlin? Yeah, yeah. that's true. But yeah. I do, I also, though, like the idea of... You know, because it, this is like an iRobot thing, right? Fair. Where it's like comes back to 
this this overall theme and this is maybe part of it is that there's so many themes in the original i think it needs to be like honed and cut yeah that's streamlined. right yeah. streamlining is like i think the number one thing that yeah. could benefit from a remake is like get real clear with your messaging yeah what are the like three things you're trying to communicate and just communicate those yeah, yeah like the thin man doesn't also need to be a priest no. yeah we, we no, don't need yeah. that simply doesn't yeah we um, don't we don't need the biblical iconography i understand no. why in 1927 you needed that but you do not need that now yeah right. no no for sure but i think like yeah, I think kind of streamlining the messaging and and getting and cleaning those things up thematically would be helpful. I think there's something interesting, whether this stays in or not. But I, there's something interesting about the idea of of it's Jurassic Park, right? It's like mm-hmm. it, it finds mm-hmm. a way. So you got AI. No, we're in control of it. This thing does what I tell it to do. And there's also kind of an interesting feminist message in there too, right? Sure. But like this thing that I have built for my own gratification that does what I tell it to do has I've made it too smart <laughs> yeah. and now it, it, life finds a way uh, and now it's like off of, an, of, of its own accord and it'd be cool to see that robot team up with the original yes yeah and that is oh that that's is, your, okay like uh I don't tech can go wrong as well mm-hmm. right like w- w- basically the messaging being we put too much into so trust you, you into want tech. the robot to also be convinced by original maria kind of okay i think it'd be interesting i'm not saying that's the way to do it but i do think it'd be kind of like i don't know it's like if the robot is looking at things <laughs> so if the robot's it, starting from a place it's the, of, of reason yeah it would beg to and, and it's constantly learning right I'm going it to make would, a reference, but finish the thought. If it's coming from a place of reason and, and emotionless reason, and it's learning, if it looks objectively, gets out of its bubble, and perceives the world that we are in, mm-hmm. and it's measuring right versus wrong, what side is it going to pick at the end yeah. of it? Which, the what you're saying is, you know? what you're saying is very... Original iRobot, the book iRobot, mm-hmm. has yeah. separate from the movie. Yes, as for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then what you're describing is the ship of Theseus scene from WandaVision. Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Which, I'm not saying it has to go this way, but I'm saying that for me, it's like an interesting. You know, I think that there's something. Um, there is something that in me in with these stories that kind of long you kind of want the monster to kill the master yeah you do kind of you long do for that a little i bit. also think you can lean into the whole ai nature of whatever image it's trying to create is inherently corrupted and broken mm-hmm. of like i'm just trying i'm just trying to create the world you wanted me to create mm-hmm. yeah but you're destroying everything in order to do it right, right. Of like the 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 machine itself genuinely believing in the thing it's trying mm-hmm. to do but doing it in yeah. a way that it, it it doesn't understand the consequences of its own actions, as opposed to the original Maria, mm-hmm. who was all about the consequences of the actions, because right. that's how she was building everything up. Of like, you you like this thing, but you have to understand all the steps we took to get there, mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. opposed to robot Maria, who's like, let's just do that thing. Right. Right. No no real world consequences have been programmed into her yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. There's a reason those stories work, and that they're yeah, and that they're they've got longevity. Right. Like yeah. It's, but yeah, I think there's a couple of options there that are fun, but I think is like B C story. You know, there's all so much that happens in this movie. Yeah. yeah. There's so much. I think it does how do you guys feel movie versus series? Because I know the the one that was that was just canned over the strike was a series adaptation. I yeah. my basic rule for the for the podcast is movies only. Movies only. All okay. right. There's something to be said for a series, but I also like here's the thing. There's a possibility that if someone sat down to watch something like this mm-hmm. and it was multiple episodes, there is a lot of prestige television and a lot of that stuff's really great. I want if someone's sitting down to watch this, I want them to get the full message in that one sitting. Yeah, that's fair. Understood. And to me, my my overview of it is even though this was a two hour and 30 minute silent film, which is a long, long two and a half hours. It is. So is Dune, to be honest with you. Dune, Dune is, is a five hour movie. Yeah. Well... Which one? The, the, the well, new you, one? when you put them two, the two well, dunes together, I, sure. Dune and Tune. Du- Dune and Tune. <laughs> Dune Tune. Dune is <laughs> too long. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Is like we can have an epic two forty five. Yeah, I mean, if like, you really wanted to, I want it to be under two hours. I kind so of I. agree. Yeah, I agree. I think well, for this, so this is a, a futuristic epic sci fi. Those are expensive. I'll, I'll give it yes. to I'll give it to ten. 
Mm-hmm. That's fair. I cap so, out. No, Amanda's the, right. No mas. The, uh, we know how to edit in this in this studio. True. Yes, we do. It's true. This uh, the original reassembly or whatever was only an hour or twenty seven. And you know what? It's lean and mean. It moves. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, like, theoretically, a lot of the things that they cut, we might not necessarily have yeah, needed. No. We don't need long, lingering shots of Josephat looking sad. There's the ideas that. are there. She, Maria ran from room to room, from cave to cave mm-hmm. for so long. Yeah, I know. It was like, run, pause, grab my left breast, <laughs> stop. Do it again. Run again. <laughs> pause. Ah, uh, like it's, it was so much running and pausing and grabbing. We don't need the Tower of Babel. No. We simply don't. No, that yeah. allegory. We get the idea. Yeah. Basically, like we have we have a bunch of workers going into some miserable trudge jobs that are bad and hate. Then we meet. We go to the rich people. The son is like, "Ooh, isn't being alive wonderful?" <laughs> he runs afoul of a protester and tries to um actually her, mm-hmm. and she leads him back and actually and um actually is him even harder with reality. Mm-hmm. At which point, Dad's like, "I don't like what's happening with my son. He came and actually spoke back to me. Can't have that." Yep. And then the movie, as we described, happens. Mm-hmm. The dad keeps being like, "I don't like what my son is doing. I control everything. No one tells me no." I'm going to do whatever I can. I don't want to lose my son because I do actually care about one thing in this world and it's him. Mm-hmm. Could, well, but it could even be legacy, not necessarily him. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Successor. Mm-hmm. Well, if yeah. here's the thing. If that were the case, then the movie has to end with us killing the dad. And then the son assumes control of the empire. If it's no. the father does still, in fact, love something and it is his son, then the dad can be alive because it, in loving his son, he can also learn to love other things. Ooh, what if? robot maria kills regular maria takes her place and nobody realizes it but the audience at the end i mean that's setting up a sequel yeah all right <laughs> yeah I feel- i'm just saying like I mean, ai i'm saying that i'm saying that in this version a like the monster wins basically i think we yeah. can i think we can end. do that what i think we can do is if we're going to do that the way i would do it is i still think robot maria should be killed but in corrupting everyone and setting everything up to destroy to be destroyed, I think that she can have changed one of the machines to start building more AI robots. Mm-hmm. And that way she can die, but like the big fear of of the singularity is robots start designing their successors right. and it just spins out of control. Mm-hmm. So like So then we get Terminator, essentially. Essentially. Like we get the Skynet of everything, but like we get a bunch of like we just want to make society better. Mm-hmm. And instead of being the version in I robot where they absolutely control humanity they control all the food they control everything and they basically are just like it, humanity becomes the pet to these robot overlords who are like we're gonna keep you alive asimov's three rules are still in effect but we run everything right and if we're leading toward towards that i think that that's reasonable hmm. because it might very well be people can't really be trusted because you can start going to these little microcosms of like these rich people being mean to each other and these poor people being mean to each other and these poor people being nice to each other and these rich people being nice to each other, but it's all a big mess. And so eventually kind of the robots are realizing, well, I can't really trust humanity to do this. We better take over. End of movie. Well, I was going to ask where the middle class was, but if we're writing this for six years in the future or 75 years in the future, it's gone. Yeah, there's there, no, there there is class no middle now. class. No middle class. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, my uh, R.I.P. My, my thought, oh, yes. R.I.P. M.C. Rest in peace, future. Um, my my initial thought was the robot can still win by giving its becoming a weird martyr, and but our, everybody's already radicalized, hmm. so it, we it, could literally crucify Maria. Well, they essentially do in this they original kinda do. one. Yeah. yeah, I mean they burn the her at the stake. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but that's exactly it. Of like they're like. What is good? What is bad? How right. do you solve a problem like Maria? Yeah. Mm. Fire. Fire. fire, apparently fire, fire and rope. Fire, stone, fire and rope. Yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah it's I, a lot of fun things to play with. Here. Yeah, I, I think that's reasonable. I, I think you're right. I think that it is. We also need to very much be mercy at living at the will of the thing that we ourselves created. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's fair, and I think you're correct, mm. and I think we need to end. Some way of like, okay, we got through today, mm-hmm. but that doesn't necessarily fix tomorrow because all of these inequities are still in place and this robot Maria is still right mm-hmm. of burn it all down. Yeah. yeah. I think it's yeah. just make what, what makes for a satisfying ending, you know? 
well, I mean, in my head, the satisfying ending of a of a of a city that's being built and like is taking uh, the capital from Hunger Games and treating it like the end of Fight Club. Yeah. <laughs> Everything blowing down. Yeah. See, are, are you sure you're not really in for just the worker and the the dad shaking hands? Because I mean, that's that's <laughs> a satisfying ending too. I mean, we could play the Pixies over that, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure what's going to happen with Grot. I feel like Grot's going to have to die. Probably. Like, like it's going to have to be like they got fomented so bad that like the one person who spoke up and said, you guys can't destroy this. We'll show you. Stab. Yeah. 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 The Hunger That's... Games meets iRobot is not bad. Or yeah. The Hunger Games meets the Terminator. Yeah. yeah. I feel like all of those themes, every one of those films. They all trace back to this. Trace back to this. This Even is an Asimov. Yeah. This is kind of my first exploration into sci-fi from a creation standpoint. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You're good at it. Yeah. Hey, hey, thanks. I'm having yeah. a great time. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, the thematically and everything, it's fun, but it's very intimidating to write and create in mm-hmm. the genre. So yeah. Because like, good sci-fi is all about the metaphor. Like, mm-hmm. it, it does end up being like an empty Marvel movie where it's just, hey, it's yeah. just the spectacle and none of the substance. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like these two specific genres of, well, excuse me, sci-fi and horror are two specific genres that really have to have a message to work. Yeah. Life. Like, away. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's my favorite. Like yeah. my top three movies is Jurassic Park. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, so I that's... love the I love the genre. I've just never I've been I'm too intimidated to uh, to delve into it. But specifically the robotic, mm-hmm. you know, the robotic sci-fi and yeah. all of it is for me very like oof, like it's a lot. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's a lot, but we also kind of live it too, mm-hmm. and that's that's I, I i mean from somebody who's been watching this stuff since i was a little kid like you do kind of see the parallels and it's scary it's really scary mm-hmm. i always find the five <laughs> the five minutes in the future thing of like if it, if this little thing extrapolated what does that look like yes. yeah it's yeah. like black mirror that's all yeah. black mirror and they do mm-hmm. it pretty excellently i think and yeah. that is, and that is kind of what we're doing of our three things are if the billion the billionaire capitalist can tr- continue to control the media what if AI is out of control? And what if there is an overwhelming disparity between the rich and the poor? Those are kind of our three things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we are trying to bridge the overwhelming disparity between the rich and the poor. We are addressing what cap, what uh, artificial intelligence run amok can do. And we are saying how bad it is if the media and the newspapers are controlled by the people who should be criticized mm-hmm. by the news and the media. Because that, that's the one thing we haven't really addressed yet. Of how do we take the newspapers and everything away from this one of these nine families? Mm-hmm. Of like, how do we have the workers seize the means of production? Mm-hmm. It could even weaponize be, it. Right? Oh, well, what I was going to say was like old school guerrilla techniques. Everybody is tuned in on a digital phone. Of yeah. some sort of digital device, whether it be your future Google Glasses, whatever the that was a bad reference. The but, uh, but Vision the, Pro or whatever. Right? Uh, it can even be simpler than that. Of like everyone has the phone and that's what they look at at all times. Yes. And the dad is upset because he finds people walking around with pieces of paper. I was just gonna say that's what I was, If we're in this like yeah Fahrenheit four fifty one world where there's in height and even more where there's like no paper or no physical media anymore, right? We've yeah. gone away from any form of physical media, period. Yeah, that's um, exactly... And one of their, like, underground encampments is a uh, mill. Oh. Yeah. It's like a, yeah. an old newspaper with a press. And that's, yes. like, how yeah. they... You know, because in theory, if you get caught with this, you just set it on fire. Yeah, and right. And your, your evidence you're, is you're gone. You're gone, You're yeah. done. Um, so it's kind of a perfect system where you swallow it or whatever right yeah. versus um having like a chip or something on you sure so um, yeah so i think i think that's our resolution for the the wealthy controlling the media of mm. people stop looking at their phones and start looking at these pieces of paper and yeah because exactly... then it's like holy shit this is paper where did you get this yeah yeah so then it's you know this kind of interesting because paper money's gone of course right of, of money course. currency's yeah. gone yeah when you have these things people want to get their hands on them because it's paper or they've never seen it before and it can be passed along pretty easily and mm-hmm. uh discreetly yes yeah, absolutely was, you know you can just kind of mm-hmm. do the old prison high five and mm-hmm. everyone loves passing notes everybody does mm-hmm. and so like so that's how we address that we had we addressed ai by like showing ai running out of control and like being unanswerable to to people and how that's a problem 
and how we don't necessarily have a solution for that yet. That's the one that we're like, we believe we have a solution of like maybe putting a stop to it. But once it's out there, it's out there and we have to f- figure out a way to, I don't know, God forbid, regulate it. Mm. Um, and But that that's the one where like we have that little sense of this one's not completely in control yet. Mm. And then we have the like the disparity between the rich and the poor and it's to actually start seeing them as people. Mm-hmm. And so I think we have our three issues and our three resolutions. So I think we have our story and our plot. Yeah, feels good. Yeah, feels, so, feels good to me. Yeah. So that means that it's time to talk about cast. I did a couple gender swaps, mm-hmm. but I do think we should start with the son who I did leave as a boy. Okay. I also left him as a boy because I felt like the 1927 version of Fredder would, would very easily translate 100 years into the future into some weird party boy frat yeah, bro absolutely and that's interesting to watch that transformation i kind of had the same thought yeah and uh so my casting for that role is uh harry shum jr who he was in crazy rich asians but like mm-hmm. i think the thing that you two will know him from is he was the one getting rakakooied in everything everywhere all at once yes <laughs> and oh, right, so he right, right, he's right. a very he's a very pretty young man but he also clearly has a sense of humor and also, like, can do big emotions mm-hmm. of, like, he can very much be the party boy because, like, he's he also was on Glee. Mm-hmm. And, like, you also, like, <laughs> as someone who's, like, having this big emotional thing to a raccoon animation. And, like, I think he can be able to take himself seriously and be that heightened version of, like, crazy excess while also being able to leave room for... Uh, I don't know, real emotions, let's say. So that, that's who I had in mind for, for that character. Uh, who did you two have? I had Barry Keoghan. Okay. Kind of a weird take, I think. It's not a weird this. take. He, I've only really seen him play these sort of like... First of all, I think he's so good at playing complex emotions. Mm-hmm. And I've only really seen him play this kind of lower class lower class aspiring character or just lower class character and i thought it'd be interesting to see him but i think that he as a person in in interviews and stuff he's very not high class but high stature Mm -hmm. i think he's very at ease with himself and who he is so i think it'd be interesting to see that type of person kind of yeah be shaken I don't know if he's, like, a little too old for this character. Well, he is 10 years younger than Harry Shum Jr., so there is is that. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Barry Keoghan was born in 92, so he's 31, and uh, Harry Shum Jr. was 82. Okay. So Mm. uh, he is younger than the guy I brought. He doesn't look younger, but he is younger. He's He plays... He can play young very yes. well. Yes, he can. Um, but I thought he was. I thought he was brilliant in Saltburn and um, yeah, or not Saltburn. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Saltburn, Salt Burn, but also yeah. in um, the Banshees of Inisherin. Mm-hmm. He's just a, a very complex uh, set of emotions on screen that I dig a lot. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went with Noah Shap, who mm. is the uh, youngest of everyone. The we've youngest cast of so all far. of them. Yes. <laughs> How do I know um, him? St- he's Will on Stranger Things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I felt like somebody who is so good at being reserved and keeping their emotions in check would be a good... And also his real life, Noah Schapp, being kind of a fashion party boy, would would uh, fit quite well in this playboy kind of world. Yeah. he. Uh, I'm. I feel like I'm leaning more towards Barry Keoghan. I feel like he kind of rides the line of he could very easily be that party boy, mm-hmm. but also we see him as being the the Banshees of Inisherin, and like a little bit more just like direct having emotions. Like like I think he can span the gamut a little bit more than either of the ones that you or I brought mm-hmm. in, Kevin. So that's where I would push us to if that's okay with you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah do it. I'm not not married to anything here. except making a good movie. Yeah, hey, let's make a good movie, Amanda. Who did you have for the dad? Also, oh, I realized dad. that we got this deep into the podcast and never actually introduced either of you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe at the end. We'll do that at the end. We're we'll... we're very famous. Uh, <laughs> you know uh, our voices. Both of us are very famous. You don't need to introduce us. <laughs> um, who did you have for the dad? Who did I have for the dad? I'm looking at my list. Can I ask? Can I ask somebody else go first? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, for for uh, is it is it Joe Frederson? We'll we'll deal with the names later. Okay, all right. So I went with somebody who is a little unnerving. 
It was a little unnerving. Okay. Uh, and a, a famous, more older character actor. Uh, I went with Willem Dafoe. Okay. Mm, yeah, that's fair. He can do that. Yeah, Damn. quite well. So Definitely an intimidating presence if that's what he chooses to be, but also incredibly charming if that's what he chooses to be. And that's why I thought he was a good, he's very good at gaslighting, and he's also very, very scary. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He's very good at that. I think that's fair. I think that's good. That's a good one. Damn, that, that's a really good one. Oh, um, Jason Isaacs is who I had. I don't think I know who that is. Um, I don't either, actually. He was in The Patriot. He was the bad guy in The Patriot. He's also Lucius Malfoy in the Harry Potter movies. Oh. So he okay. may be a little old for this now, but... He, for the I dad? think all three of us have cast people who are a little bit older, especially for a 31-year-old. Like, I think casting a dad in the... Is he in his 60s? 70s, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, he has, he has the same birthday as me. Hey! Oh, hey. I don't know. That's pretty big swing. <laughs> uh, he, he was born in 63, so he's... 60. He's seven, really good. He was just he's like 71. So I, really good. I went with an American. Okay. I also gender swap this character. Okay, great. Because I like the idea oh, of... Oh, that's fun of it being like a... Sorry, I'm cutting you off. I'm just excited. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of a very stoic, iron, like, I created this with my own hands uh-huh. and no one is going to take this from me woman. And I think that there are a few women, who, women who'd be really good at capturing that idea. And one of them is someone who has been a part of Hollywood for a very, very long time, and that's Jane Fonda. Oh, yeah. And I mm. I like Jane Fonda, especially because she's been hanging out with Lily Tomlin for quite some time, and I know that she is more left-wing than we would think. Oh, yeah. Of because she well, gets Jane, arrested all the time. Jane yeah. Fonda is, is yeah. the most yeah. left-wing you can get. Can and, I counter with another woman? Sure. Uh, Julianne Moore. Okay, why Julianne Moore? Because I think that she plays, she can play hard ass, she commands a room, she can play icy, but she also has a vulnerability that can get people on her side. And I think she's, I think this person has to be charismatic. Absolutely. And I think that she has that charisma. I think she does. The reason I would push us towards Jane Fonda is because we know that she would absolutely be believing in the message of maybe maybe not so much capitalism. Yeah. I think... Jane Fonda would play the grand, the like grand. Yeah, I really don't know if Jane Fonda would uh, would actually sign up Jane to, Fonda's to in her, like, play mid, that. Yeah, mid to late she's 80s. almost ninety. Yeah, yeah, she is eighty six. That is yeah. a strong point. But yeah, well, like, I do love having a matriarch in there, though. It'd be yeah. cool to have her in there. Yeah. Well, especially if she lured a young woman who it turns out was pregnant away mm-hmm. from her life of leading a revolution and instead led her to a life of wealth and art, whatever art deco beauty yeah she could even be like her own character kind of whispering in the grandson's ear and the father is still you know you could still have the the crazy patriarch but... i feel i don't necessarily want like the ooh the crone manipulating from the shadows like if she's in control i want her in control like i'm happy to go with a with a dude or a dad but like that's kind of why this was one of the characters i was like this is a character i think can be gender swapped no, oh, it absolutely can. Yeah. Um, and and I, we I certainly can you. do Julianne Moore. I just don't know if Jane Fonda is the. <laughs> it, she may just not be. Of the age. Yeah. yeah, certainly because of the age. Like you're not, you're not wrong. But how many empires are run by people slowly turning to dust, and we just need them to retire uh, and hand off the reins to someone younger? Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like it's more oppressive if it is somebody younger who is not of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Jane Fonda's a perfect age to be running for president. Yeah, right. Or uh, on but the Supreme Court. Any other world leader. Yeah, like, that, like, you're right. She is probably too old, and I think Julianne Moore probably is the better casting. I don't know where Julianne Moore lo- lands politically. Hmm... Yeah, she's pretty she's quiet pretty... about that. That's but... never a good I sign. She was pretty left. I think she is. I just don't think that she's. I, I personally haven't seen. It. That doesn't mean it's not out there. <laughs> okay, uh, new pitch, different. Somebody who's left uh, that is a different Clary Starling, uh, Jodie Foster. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yep. Done. Jodie Foster. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. That that works for me. Steely, powerful, reserved, commands uh, a room. Absolutely. Scary as fuck. She is. <laughs> in, in, in the best way. Yeah, I know. I 100%. Know. Yeah. Fully on board. Yes. Right. So the next person I cast... So then obviously we need to talk about Maria. We simply must. We simply yes. must. Yeah. 
And you said I you wanted Anya Taylor Joy. I had suggested Anya Taylor Joy. Your face was, you did not seem happy with that suggestion. I have no strong opinions about Anya Taylor Joy one way or the other. I, I, I haven't seen Furiosa. Furiosa, by all accounts, I haven't it's excellent. Either. She's good in The Queen's Gambit and yeah, she's, in... Uh, she's great in everything she's ever done. Yeah, everything I've seen in the menu, she's really yeah. good. I thought mm. she might play that dichotomy well of the a very... Wow. Well, because I'm like, I want somebody who's like strong. Yes. And so I thought, you know, and then strong and then if you're starting a character at an eight, yes. then like imagine them at a 12. Right. right. Yeah. And so I thought she might be capable of that. Absolutely. Um, I think she's I'm great. I'm open. The, the only problem I have with Anya Taylor-Joy is that she looks like someone who could blend in with the, like, if we're doing, like, the haves and the have-nots of, like, Anya Taylor-Joy is absolutely a, a have and has kind of been her whole life. Mm. Like, I'm pretty sure she comes from money, but I guess I don't know that. Probably. I think she's she Argentinian. Might. I'm not sure. So I was going for someone who we first saw in Orange is the New Black. She has had an interesting career. I've really only seen her in Orange is the New Black. I've heard her voice in Encanto, and then I saw her in Doom Patrol, where she's very good. I went with the actress Diane Guerrero. Mm, yeah, I know mm. who you're talking about. Who, her character name in Doom Patrol is Crazy Jane, where she plays someone with multiple personalities. I can't replace her face. I'm so sorry. It's all right. I only know her from okay. Orange is the New Black. Yeah. Okay, I think I only know her from there too. Now that I see her, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, but. so she is. She's very good, and I I like the idea of. I I just think she would be able to do this role very well. Yeah, I don't know. The, she she's who I'm I'm pushing forward. Kevin, okay. who did you have? Uh, for me, I actually I looked at the latest Catwoman, and I went with Zoe Kravitz for this role. That's also because a she. I feel like she could really rile somebody uh a group into a frenzy that's true in, in two different ways which is what happens in this movie yeah so and she plays she can also play softer and hard and that's that's yeah. kind of what i was uh uh you know all three of our castings can do that like yeah, that, yeah. That, that, absolutely anya taylor joy can do that as mm-hmm. well it yeah. has and i feel like uh the duality of the role she'd be good mm-hmm. in the duality of of playing both Good and bad, Maria. Or, yes, know, robot and and uh, non robot, non robot, <laughs> non human. That's the word I'm looking ah, for. Ah, there, there it goes. Go. You got there. That word. Yeah. Hmm. Thoughts. I like that one. Zoe mm. Kravitz. Yeah. I like Zoe Kravitz. I like yours too. I just haven't seen her in a whole lot. I that is kind of why I, I mean, want to like, push for her because I don't want it to be instantly like, wait, who is that? I don't yeah. want it to instantly be like, oh, Anya Taylor Joy, obviously I she's or it. oh, Zoe Kravitz, obviously. Uh, I think for this one, I'm just gonna take it. I'll have us do uh, Diane Guerrero for this one. Okay. But then I probably won't get any more. Let's move on to Rotwang. 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 Na, 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 na. Yeah, so um, <laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is a silly casting for me. I went with a, a character that I, uh, I first saw him in Taskmaster because he's great. Um, he also is on Our Flag Means Death. He was in Four Weddings and a Funeral, the, the show. He is a British actor named Guz Khan. Mm. Oh, Guz Khan. Yeah. Guz Khan. He's great. He's very, very yeah. silly. I don't know him really like him. I didn't even know there was a four weddings and a funeral show. I didn't either. Hey, oh, oh, Gus? G U Z. G U Z. Goose. Yeah. And, like, okay. I can instantly tell you why he's not necessarily great. Because, like, if you want him to play the scientist who invents everything, he does. That's not necessarily the sort of casting he normally does. Mm-hmm. But I will say that he plays the sort of character who has the confidence to believe he could. Right. Sure. Um, I actually wonder if he'd be better as Groot or Grot. Grot? Possible. We will cross that bridge when we get to it. But that that's who I had. Charismatic. Uh, Amanda, who did you have for Rotwang? I had uh, uh, Alan Tudyk. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, that is very silly. I, it is very silly. Obviously, he, you know, he's a tremendous character actor. And uh, yeah, I just, I thought he'd bring some levity, but also some like manic energy. And he's very good at menace. Yeah, yes. Yeah, he mm-hmm. has a little sinister there too, which I Absolutely. which I dug. Yeah. Which you pick up during his uh role as a villain on Doom Patrol. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. Mhm. He's great as the omnipotent narrator or whatever he was. Mhm. Who do you have? Oh, this is this is my turn to shoehorn my uh, my favorite guy in 
uh, I'm going to match your manic energy by like times 10 and cast Nicolas Cage as Rob oh. Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> I love Nicolas yeah, Cage. Yeah, Nicolas Cage is great. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this one. Because, um, I mean, he is mad scientist. Yeah. Crazy eyes. To the extreme. Yeah. <laughs> he he would be a crazy person. He would be a, a, a tremendous distraction. Yeah, um, which is perfect. <laughs> I, oh, I don't know. I don't know which one to do on this one. I might just give it to whichever one of us gets the least people, which, so far, you're winning. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Man, uh, Nicholas Cage is going to be really disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, to somebody's going to have to tell somebody's him. Somebody's going to have to break there, it to There's him. no role he doesn't turn down, and That's... there's no way he hasn't seen this movie. You know it's what, true. though? There's no role that he's done that I've seen him in that I was like, I wish it were not him in this role. That's, That's also, also fair. So, very true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He can keep taking them all for all I care. Yeah, exactly. I want to see long legs so bad. Yeah. It looks so scary. <laughs> it looks fun, yeah. Yeah. Did either of you have someone for, like, the Thin Man Enforcer character? I did. I don't think it'll fit, though. Let's find out. So I chose a, a character. He's not a character actor, but he is a, a Chinese actor who has predominantly been in Chinese films. His name is Cheng Chen. Okay. And he is... Uh, I, I looked a lot at Dune the because it's kind of a one-for-one one empirical sci-fi remake. And uh, but looking at some of his other work, I feel like he could very much be a silent enforcer. Yeah, like the Thin Man. And he's someone I've never heard of, which always gets a plus in my books. So I would happily do that. Did you have someone for Derek Mears? Derek Ooh. Mears, and I don't know who that is either. Who yeah. is I know him from I know him mostly from improv, but you'll know him from all kinds of stuff. But he, he's Swamp he, Thing. Swamp Thing. A lot of times he's in prosthetic. Oh, this guy. He yeah, was, uh, he's a, he wears prosthetics quite a bit uh, in things. He's a he was pinhead he, at one point, I think. Right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. 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 Razor. Um, that, he's got a a great that's very good. structural yeah. is his face yeah. for this. He's scary. He's like he is scary and he's a doll. I know. But yeah. like yeah, but like uh that build and that face coming at you with the wrong intention is like, ooh, you don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean and kind of futuristic. I can't explain mm-hmm. why, but he no, feels absolutely. futuristic to me too. I, I mean I kind of had like a, a similar idea. I went with Jumon Hansu mm. with the kind of the same idea of like can be very intimidating. Obviously in real life an absolute sweetheart. Mm-hmm. Very nice. And like I just also find it funny that he was Bonsley, Bosley in the new Charlie's Angels. Oh, was he? Oh. Yeah, he's great. Oh, funny. And like huh. when they did the the What If series, when he's like doing the voice for his various like uh, Marvel character, he's so funny. I just think he's delightful. But I'm happy to go with either of these. Like you two decide. I'm happy to go with either of those options. I, I like Derek Mears. I, okay, personally, yeah, let's I think. Do it. Yeah, I love giving Derek Mears a shout out for anything. Yeah, he's great. Check him out with the Resistance improv show. He's very fun, and the show is a blast. I believe that. It's an improvised action comedy, and they do stunts. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Me. Did either of you cast Joseph Hat, the fired guy? <laughs> yeah, who did you have? I cast Oscar Isaac. Interesting. Okay. Oh, okay. Why? Because I felt like he could play the duality of that role, and also he cleans up real nice and can get real dirty. That's fair. Time. That's true. All that, all of that is accurate and true. I had a weird one. I had a real wild card, which is Matt Berry. <laughs> oh, okay. There's not. I, I wish I could explain hmm. to you even why. I, I don't know if he's capable of playing someone who isn't at the most confident person in the world. Yeah, but I kind of want to give him the shot. I don't <laughs> know. Right. I, but I don't anymore. I want Oscar Isaac. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mine was a uh, someone neither of you have ever heard of named uh, John Cairns. I again saw him on Taskmaster, but he's in Drunk History. He's on Guessable. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. He's, yes, he's I very, know, very I know funny. Who that is. Yes. And he can play like Hank, like. He has confidence, and then you like point out the, everything wrong with what he's saying. He's like, "Oh, right," and then just returns to being just like kind of sad dude. Mm. But again, I'm I'm more than happy to go with Oscar Isaac. And then the only other character I had was Grot the engineer. That's that's the only other one I had as well. Did I cast Grot? Did anybody else have one? I did. I had Zach Cherry. So oh yeah, I like Zach, I like Zach Cherry a lot. He's also in. Uh, he's the Spider Man. Do a flip. Yeah, the guy from the Marvel show. Oh, yeah, all right. he's great. He was the one in Shang Chi who was filming like the the bus fight scene. Mm-hmm. He's very funny. Sure. He's also one of the like. He's also hosts. Fallout. 
I get he's in Fallout. He's also one of the hosts on the American Bake Off. <laughs> Kevin, who did you have? I I went with somebody who is kind of a gruff, uh, you know, working. Looks like he has working hands. Uh, I, I went with Josh Brolin. Yeah. Which yeah, I'm not really gonna fight for him. Yeah. I'm just somebody who felt like it might go in easily. I like a Brolin, but I I think it's hard. Josh Brolin's on the screen. You're watching Josh Brolin. Yeah, I yeah. Know. I know, I know, and that's why I was like, ah, but I do yeah. love him. That said, Zach Cherry, Zach let's Cherry, that's, that's, yeah, do Zach it. And if I get Zach Cherry, that means that Rot Wang is Nick Cage. Hey, the one thing <laughs> that, that matters. <laughs> the one thing that I'm going to insist on is that it needs to be Nicolas Cage in prosthetics, so he's unrecognizable. Absolutely, he's even funnier in prosthetics. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> His in Ranfield, he was. Mwah, in prosthetics. Yeah, he's but we could tell he and... was Nick Cage. I You're know. You're never not going to be able to tell he's Nick Cage. It's true. I he doesn't to... act. He just comes in. Well, no, because I don't I want him to be so... in any of the commercials, and then we see this like this, this crazy warped uh, dude come But that's out. what's like so a, funny. Like a less like, Grossman we, effect? We won't, you won't know that he's in it. Yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. It's going like, to um, it's gonna be like, oh, what's his face? Yeah, less uh, Grossman, yeah. Yeah, well, I was thinking like Predator. Kevin Spacey at the end of Seven. Sure. When nobody nobody knew that he was in Seven, and then... He came in, and you're yeah. like, oh my god, it's yeah. Kevin yeah. Spacey. Yeah. Yes, like that. Hmm. Okay. But not Kevin Spacey. But not, not Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey. We do <laughs> so then we've got him. a writer, and we've got a director. I have two separate. Okay. Uh, do you two have hyphenates, or do you have two separate people? I have two separate Separates. people. Okay. Go ahead. Somebody Let's talk else. about writer. For this, I went with a writer who, I'm going to be honest, I don't know if he speaks English. He may not, but he's the writer for Godzilla Minus One. Oh. And I figured if we're going to be doing something that is commenting on soci- the way society is or what we've built mm. and like having a real, being able to have a real take and being able to represent that in a big genre movie, it is Takashi Yamazaki. And I, while I think there's a decent chance that we won't go with him, especially especially if he can't speak English, which I don't know that he can, he wrote and directed the hell out of that movie and it is excellent it is a fantastic and it that is. does kind of do a lot of the things that we are trying to do now it's especially as like taking the concept of godzilla and reintroducing it to do all of these different comments on society as it is and the way things are treated in japan it was very good if you haven't seen godzilla minus one go see godzilla minus one. Oh, it's fantastic hmm. it's it's really good yeah Kevin, who do you have so for me, I, I uh, like I said, I looked at recent sci-fi adaptions of the similar vein. The writer here, I, I went with Joe, uh, I'm going to butcher his name. John Spates, I think is his name. I think that's how you pronounce it. Okay. S-P-A-I-H-T-S. Mm. He's written a lot of recent mid-budget sci-fi prior to his last two gigs, which were Dune 1 and 2. And I'm not... The, Biggest fans of those movies, but I know, like, he can get the job done. Uh, I know that he's got experience adapting classic science fiction into something more palatable for a modern audience, and I feel like that's that's something we do here. So. That is something that we do here. He also wrote Passengers and uh, the Tom Cruise The Mummy. That movie was spectacular. <laughs> you say it with a straight face under your mask. Yeah, well, that's why I have it on. <laughs> uh, he also wrote Prometheus and yes. The Darkest Hour. Like he certainly had it, like a good chunk of things. Um, but Amanda, who did you have? Who are you deciding on between your multiple options right here in this moment? Jordan Peele. Okay. Oh. Because obviously he's a tremendous storyteller, but he's also written action. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, which I think people forget because he did Keanu. Yeah, yeah. I think he knows comedy, which I think this needs a touch of. Absolutely, it's so dark. it does. Yeah, it's pretty dry. It's very yeah. dry, dark. He's done sci-fi. Now he knows how to heighten tension, and he knows more than anything how to take a message and deliver it in a clear, very creative way that people will be talking about for like years. Yeah, that's, that's very true. true. That is very true. And because this is ideal remake, we'd be able to get him to write something that he would then not direct. Yeah, in theory. Okay, great. Yeah, love it. Uh, listen, I would be on board with him as a director too. I, yeah. well, um, that's fair. But uh, I, for this, I, th- I would. But uh, I, but I, I'd be very interested, interested to see what he does with the script. And I yeah. think his scripts are not bloated. Yeah, they're very for as much punch as they pack with the message. They are pretty concise. They're clean. Which they, in, they're they clean. move fast. Yes. Yeah, they're Importantly, good for a Jordan Peele script, this is a one-word title. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Crucial. Yeah, absolutely. Crucial. Yeah. Super important. But imagine, just imagine, like seeing 
hearing, okay, so you're sitting in theater and it's in Dolby and it's like the screen is dark and you hear, and you hear like a, it sounds like a ship is flying through the theater and then you hear like hammering and then it's Jordan Peele's Metropolis. Yeah. 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 And being yeah. like, oh, what's that? Yeah. And then nothing. And you'd, you'd go home and you'd be like, what is, like, what is it? What is it going to be? I mean, I'm convinced. Oh, hey. We'll have Jordan Peele as our writer. Let's see what happens for our director. Mm. Who do you have for director? Director, I I didn't have a great answer for director. I'm sorry to say. That's fine. If you well, don't have I someone, that's not a big deal. Did, though, man. Yeah, I mean, your your <laughs> answer can be also be Jordan Peele. Yeah. yeah, I I I had initially thought written and directed by, and then I was like, maybe that's a cop out. But then I didn't come up with another director, which is more nothing wrong with that. Out. So I'll keep thinking about it. But uh, yeah, I chose somebody who's tackled quite a few science fiction eps eps science fiction <laughs> movies over the past few years and and done them on quite the grand epic scale i i went with denis villeneuve denis villeneuve villeneuve mostly because of blade runner actually okay his blade mm. runner sequel um looked the visual in that so in a lot of places really uh, leaning on the dune for this one that too. Again, I don't. I didn't even like Dune. I like, know it's crazy. <laughs> uh, I love Arrival, but yes. But the new Blade yeah. Runner. The Blade Runner. Yeah, it's uh, solid. It's great. The, solid choice. The imagery in that is actually what what yeah. uh, uh, drew me to him, uh, especially the larger cityscapes with almost similar Art Deco stylings, in mm-hmm. like the Vegas parts where they meet Harrison Ford. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I just feel like he he's a solid choice, and also. To tell a story like this, he you need somebody who's not American. <laughs> I mm, think I think that is possibly true. That said, my director is American, mm-hmm. and I think he's very good at limbasting rich people, which is kind of what we're going to be doing. This is a guy who also directs things that are funny but very good. Mm-hmm. And I spent a lot of time digging through different shows and this and trying to like figure out what I wanted to do with this director. And eventually, I was like, I don't know why I'm running from this. Clearly, the director that I want is Ryan Johnson. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. like we take the the wealth. Uh, and the excess of Knives Out and Glass Onion, and then pair it with Poker Face. Yeah. And then we take the grand sweeping sci-fi of the fact that he did The Last Jedi. A grand sweeping sci-fi of the fact that he did Looper. I mean, sure. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of the same same basic idea of like, mm-hmm. it is though we are talking about those three things. Yeah. Yeah, we are. And like, we, we're in a theater, we hear a, a car goes by, and we hear a tone, and all of a sudden, Jordan Peele, Ryan Johnson, Metropolis. Hmm. I can do that too. It's pretty good. <laughs> I, I, do have, I do have one now. Okay. Okay. Hit us. Mark my lot. So... Known mostly for TV, right? Okay. But his... So he did the menu, which I fucking love, and it's yeah. very sharp and biting. I love that. But is here it... is his TV resume. Succession. Game of Thrones. Uh, Minority Report. You know, he does... And, and he's done some film, too. But if you look at the things that he's directed, there, and that he clearly, like, finds interesting, shameless even, mm. they're... You've got a beautiful blend of sci-fi power dynamics, and he is not American. Yeah. Either he's right. British, I believe, and and this like fight for power, yeah. and he's directed things on quite the epic scale. And just to yes, and you satire which and is, satire, which is what yeah. I really, really Where, think. And, and Metropolis... biting, biting, but yeah. he does yeah. fast very well yeah and and in these big giant kind of power dynamics so. the menu is one of my favorite movies in the past i years. loved the it's menu hilarious. and people i thought it was really <laughs> funny and i don't know people didn't dig it but i yeah I, I there really... are people who don't like the menu i thought the menu was pretty much universally like no this really? was good no yeah. i know a lot of people are just like oh it was so i'm like it's yeah, too but it, dark i'm like yeah but it was they're like it was so over the top i'm like because it's, it's supposed to satire be. yeah, yeah no. no i i adored it i, I don't give any credence to to it's too over the top. Absolutely not. Nicholas Holt is a national treasure. Yeah. <laughs> he's not our national treasure. He's, he's from a Kate, national treasure. But he's, he's <laughs> no Nicholas Cage. He's, he's, he's from a country that's very good about national treasures. That's true. That's and the menu runtime hour forty seven minutes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 
Not quite no, a, a tight a menu. 90. A menu. A menu. Uh, Not quite a tight 90, but close enough for close. me. Listen, for a film made and it was a 20, 23? It's yeah. impossible to know. <laughs> what, what, last year. I mean, listen. Wait, what year is it now? Any movie 2022. Right. Clocking in in the last 10 years at under, under two, two hours. hours that's that good. It, it, all, all my props. Yeah, if you, if I agree you, with if that. If you're both on board for... The, I like Ryan Johnson. You know I'm a, You know that I'm generally yeah. speaking a big Ryan Johnson fan because I, I love that I action. I like him as a person, too. He's a nice guy. But like, like but, I said, I will go with whatever you two think. Like, I am happy to do either way. I think your director... Uh, Mark Mylod. Mark Mylod, thank you, is probably the best choice for this. In okay. my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Great. If He's I saw perfect. Mark Mylod and Jordan Peele, I would... I'd be in. I would yeah, buy. I would like, buy right. so. I'd buy so many tickets. Like the satire is going to be. This is going to be hilarious. <laughs> yeah, but it's also going to be like a visually interesting yeah, project, right? Um, Which it needs to be. Um, yeah, absolutely, it does. Like that. That's kind of why this has stood the test of time. Is that it was so. It was so visually compelling. Right. It pushed the medium to a new level. Oh but... yeah. Like, it, things that people didn't think were possible were made possible in this movie. Yeah, yeah. And, and are now it superfluous, was... like, not superfluous, uh, the thing where it's, uh, the, the it's, 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 every, it's everywhere now. It's everywhere now, mm-hmm. yeah. It's kind of like Star Wars. The, Star, the, the word original. I'm trying to think of where it's like, oh, well, now it's, a, it's not innocuous, it's not superfluous, it's... Widely known. Yep, yep. Uh, whoever whoever shouting know. is shouting at their podcaster right now. Yep, yeah, that's it. That is the word I'm thinking of. What Thank are you, you trying to say? The word where it's like, oh, it's it's everywhere. It's not superfluous. It's not innocuous. It's, it's omnipresent. No, it's, it's something that ends in us. It it's doesn't matter. us. God damn, ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. Oh, ubiquitous. There it is. Yes. Yeah, that yes. one's that one's for you, listener. Yeah, yeah. That was the word I wanted. Yeah. Yes, but it is ubiquitous. It is ubiquitous. <laughs> yes. It was the right word. It was. It just couldn't couldn't find. We it. got there. It, it turns out all the places that, that where that word was wasn't here. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, but yeah, I think we've got ourselves a movie. Let me take you through our Metropolis. What are we naming our son and our dad? Our, our son. Uh, I'm sorry, our son and our mom. Okay. They was it was Federer and Federson. That's boring. Very. But like we want just kind of like standard white people names. Zane. Zane for the son. Yep. And the mom, Eve. Great. Oh, yeah, that's good, actually. Great. Yeah. Metropolis. Zane, the son, will be played by Barry Keoghan. Eve, the mother, will be Jodie Foster. Maria will be Diane Guerrero. Rotwang will be Nick Cage in prosthetics. The thin man slash enforcer will be Derek Mears. Josephat, the fired butler guy, will be Oscar Isaac. Grot, the engineer, will be Zach Cherry. All this will be written by Jordan Peele and directed by Mark My... That will be directed by will be directed by Mark Mylod. That is Metropolis. You both gonna go see this movie? I oh, would yeah. see the shit out of this I movie. I would too. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Opening night, which yeah. I don't do very often. Yeah. Well, then now <laughs> is the time for a plugs, but most importantly, so who are you two? Who are we? Uh, I'm Amanda Barnes. I'm a, a writer and a producer. Uh, currently working and full time at a, a YouTube production company. Uh, you can find me at It's Amanda Barnes on Instagram and just generally around. Yeah. Around around town. I'm Kevin Mosteller. I am a film and television mm-hmm. composer. I've scored lots, many, many hours of, of uh, low-budget horror films as well as some l- less hours of, <laughs> of unscripted television. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Kevin Mosteller Music and also just generally around. <laughs> uh, m- mostly in the valley usually sometimes at the new beverly cinema or you could go to my website www.kevinmostellermusic.com oh yeah my name is sam gash you can find me on instagram at ideal remake or you can find me on blue sky at sam gash s-a-m-g-a-s-c-h i'm a writer and i do other things too uh but i'm not around you won't find me he, he hides so rarely around yeah yeah i'm elusive <laughs> you might say i'm not ubiquitous hey i knew hey. you were gonna bring it back i was I, I did hard for that word yeah <laughs> um but yeah that brings us to the end of this episode so i will end this episode the same way i end every episode what is your favorite quote from the movie metropolis
just silence? It's just silence. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of I was like. I was going to read mine. And but then please I was like, do. No, no, no. no. Uh, listen to me, exclamation point. I want to trade lives with you. Also good. Point. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Rotway. Rotway. Rotway.